This is 3.9, video two. So we've basically been um, <clears throat> talking about how to find a general antiderivative using a power rule. So we said that the general antiderivative was a family of functions, and that's because it could technically be shifted anywhere up and down the y-axis. Well, now if we're given some kind of an initial condition, some actual point on the graph, that eliminates all of the other possible functions and gives us one specific antiderivative. So we can actually figure out the C value, and then we would have that specific antiderivative. So notice there's a slight notation change. This time we're giving you the fact that f prime of x is 2x plus 5. So now we are telling you that we have taken the derivative of some function and gotten 2x plus 5. Now when we go backwards to take an antiderivative, it's just lowercase f of x. I know it might be a little confusing, but if you're given a derivative, f prime, you're just going to go back to the lowercase f as the antiderivative. So we're going to do the process the same way. We're going to start off by finding um, f of x by taking an antiderivative of 2x plus 5. Raise the x power by 1 and then divide the coefficient 2 by the new exponent 2, and you get 1. The constant's always just going to be 5x, and we still have a plus c. But now what we have is f of 0 equals 6. That's an x value. That's the y value. So basically, it says plug in the x value of 0, plug in the y value of 6, and solve for c. So the y value of 6... That's f of x. The x values are 0. So 0 squared plus 5 times 0 is 0. So you get that c is 6, which means that our general, excuse me, not our general, our exact antiderivative, given the initial condition that f of 0 equals 6, is x squared plus 5x plus 6. No more plus c. That is the actual function that f prime of x came from, given the fact that f of 0 is 6. So we had to get that initial condition to find the c value. Okay, let's try another one. So f prime is going to be x cubed plus 12x plus 3. The initial condition is f of 1 equals 6. So when x is 1, y is 6. Let's take the general anti, not, yes, we'll take the general antiderivative first. So this is going to be x to the fourth, dividing 8 by 4 is 2. And then we're going to have x squared, dividing 12 by 2 is 6. And then we're going to have a 3x. Don't forget your plus c until we find it. Now in this case, it says that x is 1, y is 6. So 6 goes in for f of x. Plugging a 1 in. 1 to any power is 1, so when I raise 1 to the 4th or squared or to the 1st, it's 1, so I'm going to get 2 times 1, which is 2, 6 times 1 is 6, 3 times 1 is 3, and now we can solve for c. So 6 is going to equal 8, 11 plus c, subtracting 11 on both sides, you get that c is negative 5. So our actual function, f of x, is going to be 2x to the 4th plus 6x squared plus 3x minus 5. And it is imperative that you actually write that out. Don't stop at finding c and then not write the actual function. All right, let's try another one. So f prime of x is 2x minus 3 over x to the 4th f of 1 is 10. There's our initial condition. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite f prime in a manner that I can take the antiderivative easily. So that'll be minus 3x to the negative 4 power. Now we can take an antiderivative. So f of x, antiderivative of 2x, we've done that one several times, is x squared. All right, so now we're going to have x Adding 1 to negative 4 is negative 3. Dividing the negative 3 out front by the new negative 3 is plus 1. So it's plus x to the negative 3. And we have plus c. Okay, so 10 is our y value. 
one is the x value, so x squared and x to the negative three. Again, remember, one to any power is one, so one plus one plus c. The one plus one is two, subtracting two on both sides, we get that c equals eight. So f of x is going to be x squared plus x to the negative three plus eight. Okay, and that's the actual function that this came from. Again, given the initial condition. Okay, number 11 is a little bit different. So let's start off by finding the antiderivative. It's already in a good form for us to do that. So f of x, adding 1 to x to the negative 2 is going to give me x to the negative 1. Dividing 3 by negative 1 gives you negative 3 plus c. Now, what you need to notice here is I have two initial conditions. It's written kind of all in one line there, but technically it's saying that f of 1 equals 0 and f of negative 1 also equals 0. So the fact that they're giving me two initial conditions means we need to find two different pieces of the function. So we're going to use the fact that f of 1 equals 0 first. We're going to use this one first. So that means I'm going to plug 0 in for f of x and plug 1 in for x. Again, remember, 1 to any power is 1, so that's x to the negative 1, or 1 times negative 3. So if I add the 3 to both sides, c is 3. So my function here is going to be f of x equals negative 3x to the negative 1 plus 3. But then I also have to do that with this one. So I'm going to go back to my f of x and say, okay, I'm going to plug 0 in for y, but this time I'm going to plug negative 1 in. Now, negative 1 to any power is not negative 1. However, remember that this, um, this piece right here is the same thing as negative 3 over x to the first. So if I plug negative 1 in there, I'm going to get positive 3 plus c. So subtracting 3 on both sides, you get for this one, c equals negative 3. So your function for this is going to be f of x equals negative 3 x to the negative 1 minus 3. Okay, and so you might want to ask yourself, what in the heck does that mean? How does that work? I've got two different functions. That is true, and when you have two different functions, more than likely, it's a piecewise function. Because what this graph is actually going to do, in general, it's going to look like this. The green part is down here. The blue part is up here. Because <clears throat> if you look at your function, with the plus C part, let's go ahead and put that plus, oops, sorry, plus C. That's really, th the, the function is negative 3 over X. I think I might have the, the colors flipped on this one, but it doesn't matter. No, I have them right. Um, it's 3 over X, which is basically the same as 1 over X, which looks like this. So it's undefined at 0. So the blue one is going to be the function as long as, well, let's see, what kind of a value do we plug in here? We plugged in a positive, so as long as x is greater than 0. And the green one is going to be from this one, so that's as long as x is less than 0. Remember, x can't be 0 because the actual function is undefined at 0. So this one actually came from a piecewise function. You don't have to write it in piecewise notation. Chances are probably pretty good. You're not actually going to see one like this, to be honest with you. But just in case. All right. Not much more to go. So what you should notice different here on number 12 is that we are starting off with a second derivative. And what I have is I have two initial conditions. I have an initial condition for the first derivative. I also have an initial condition for the original function. Because in order to get from the second derivative to the original function, we are going to have to take two antiderivatives. You guessed it. So 
let's start off by taking the first antiderivative. So the antiderivative of f double prime of x is f prime of x. All right, antiderivative of 4 is 4x. Antiderivative of negative 6x is going to be negative 3x squared. I'm going to start moving a little quicker when I do these. Antiderivative of negative 40x to the fourth is going to be so x to the fourth, so negative 10 x to the fourth plus c. Now I'm going to use the initial condition for the first derivative. So it says plug in 0 for all the x's, plug in 1 for the first derivative. So 1 is my first derivative. Plugging 0 into all those x's makes all the x's go away, so it really just tells us that c is 1. So my first derivative is 4x minus 3x squared minus 10x to the fourth plus 1. Now we can go ahead and take another antiderivative to get back to f of x. So the antiderivative of 4x, raising that to the second power and dividing by 2 is 2x squared. Raising the next one to the third power and dividing by 3 is going to give me negative x cubed. Raising the next one to the fifth power and then dividing that by 5 is going to give me minus 2x to the fifth plus the antiderivative of 1, which is x, plus another c value. Now we're going to use the initial condition here. So again, it says plug 0 in for all the x's. That makes all the x's go away. The y value is 2, which means c is 2. So my actual function is f of x is 2x squared minus x cubed minus 2x to the fifth plus x plus 2. Okay? And that's all there is to it. Last one. What you should notice here is that, again, we start off with a second derivative. What you should also notice is that there are no initial conditions, which means that we are going to have a general antiderivative twice. So to do a general antiderivative twice, you got to do the first one. So f prime of x the antiderivative of cosine is sine of x, because the derivative of sine is cosine. So it's sine of x plus some constant c. No way to find c in this case, so let's keep moving. The antiderivative of f prime of x is f of x, so the antiderivative of sine is going to be negative cosine the antiderivative of c, be careful here, c is a constant. It's just like having 4 or 7 or negative 3 or whatever. It's going to be that constant times x. And then we need another constant because you have to include that extra constant of integration. So you can make it a different variable if you want to. You don't want to call it c, but you could have instead of called the first one c, you could have called it c1 and then maybe the second one c2. I prefer just to use a second variable. It just is easy. But that's it. That is your general antiderivative, um, given that the second derivative was cosine of x. All right. That should be plenty enough to get you started on antiderivatives. Again, this concept will hold for almost everything that we do from here on out.